the challenge for this Fed chair at this annual Fed get-together? How big is it? It's huge, John, and good morning. It's huge because he's speaking to multiple audiences, as you pointed out. But it's also huge because he's got to deal with issues with respect to the past, the present, and the future. He's got to figure out how he's going to address his speech last year that proved so off the mark. He's got to figure out what to signal about current monetary policy. And let's not forget that we have a framework that is not fit for purpose. We have a policy framework fit for a world of deficient aggregate demand, and we are in a world for deficient aggregate supply. So put all this together, the challenge is very big, John. Mohammed, you're focused on a new word, stickiness, and you've been focused on that for a number of months now. From the incoming information, how sticky do you think that inflation dynamic is? And how much does that tell you about how much work this chairman still has to do? So I worry that core inflation is going to prove more sticky than the Fed anticipates right now. We have wages are starting to be a driver of higher <coughs> costs and eventually higher prices. So while headline inflation is going to continue to go down <coughs> for the next two months, core may prove quite sticky. And that's a real problem for them. Mm -hmm. For those of you on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, you just saw a little bit of light going out. That was one of the grizzly bears standing up and getting in the way of, of the light here. They're watching uh, here this morning as well. Dr. Alarian, people forget why you are Dr. Alarian. And it has to do with the acuity and uh, uh, concision of your game theory. You codified in the modern day the phrase T decision. Let's distill that down to the T decision that Chairman Powell has to make between now and a data busy September. And it's an important one, Tom, because right now the Fed is so late that it's looking at two challenges. It's looking at putting the inflation genie back into the bottle, and it's looking at not creating too much damage to economic growth and inequality, <laughs> something that you have been speaking to all morning. <clears throat> Look, I don't think he has any choice he's got to put the inflation genie back into the bottle. You know, there's an old saying that macro stability isn't everything, right. but without it, you have nothing. So they've got to put that inflation genie back into the bottle and do it in a determined and sustainable fashion. Okay. But this is the politics of it, Dr. O'Leary. And if you have a partial differentiation from 8% U.S. inflation, the haves are benefited when you get to 6% or 5%. The have-nots, the great middle class, are still flat on their back. What is your timeline where all of America finally gets inflation back into the bottle? So it's going to take some time because the Fed has been asleep at the wheel, um, and that's unfortunate. Tom, what you raise is, is much bigger. It is, speaks to the Fed being necessary but not sufficient to address our policy issues. Um, you've got to deal with the inequality aspect. You've got to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population with focused um, uh, fiscal policy. And you've got a lot to, to do a lot more on productivity and equal opportunity. So it's a long list, but the Fed has to focus on inflation and has to do it in a more committed fashion than it's done it so far. So it's been trying to sound, Mohammed committed, right? I mean, they've basically been saying inflation is their number one issue that they're facing. Why is the market not hearing it? Two reasons, Lisa. One is the Fed itself. Let's not forget that Chair Powell hinted, not hinted, stated that we were at the neutral rate. The minute the market heard that, it moved, and it moved in a significant fashion, and all the talk about pivot started being amplified. So that's one reason that the communication hasn't been consistent. And that's been a problem for the last year. And the second issue is that the market is looking at the impact on growth, is looking at, this, at the potential impact on markets, and as John said earlier today, remembers the fourth quarter of 2018, remembers the Fed blinking, so it believes when push comes to shove, the Fed is going to blink again, that we're going to have a flip-flopping Fed. Mohammed, what I hear from you is that you don't think this Fed blinks anytime soon. I don't know, John. I know what they should do, which is they should not blink. Um, but I, it's been very difficult to call this Fed. This Fed has unfortunately failed at analysis, failed at forecast, failed at communication. So it's very difficult to say what this Fed is going to do. It's easy to say what it should do, 
but it's, mu it's much harder to say what it should, what it's going to do. And that's why you get this disconnect that you've been talking about <clears throat> between the markets and the Fed. Easier to find out what you think. So let's go there and wrap up this segment with you on what you think. Larry Summers called that neutral comment analytically indefensible. You said on neutral, and I think you were a little bit more diplomatic about it when we last spoke, you said the zip code for neutral was higher than where we are right now. Mohammed, what is the zip code for neutral and how on earth do we know with inflation where it is and where rates where they are right now? So I don't know specifically where it is and I've been warning against spurious precision. There are so many structural changes going on. We are changing liquidity regimes. I said earlier, we're going from a world of deficient aggregate demand to a world of deficient aggregate supply. That's the world we live in now. No one knows for sure where neutral is. So you've got to try to figure out as you go along the way. And you mustn't attempt this spurious precision, because if you do, the market is going to jump immediately to conclusions, and then you're going to have to undo it. You know, the Fed itself, Fed officials have walked back that comment. It didn't take many days for other Fed officials to come out and say, we're not at neutral. Dr. Larian, I want to go to the international tone here, uh, central banker of the world, and the singular feature I have is the focus is on Plaza Accord-like partners when there is EM. Forget about idiosyncratic Turkey out over 18 lira. What will be the shock of Powell action to a more fragile emerging market uh, in third world economies? It's a high risk situation, Tom. You have higher rates, so more uncertain market conditions. You have global economic growth slowing much faster than most people expected. And you have a stronger dollar. Historically, that has not been a favorable mix for, for emerging economies. So right now, how much does this bleed back to the U.S. economy? How do you bleed through the pain that you're seeing in Europe, in China, into slowing U.S. growth and entering a recession? You know, Lisa, the quick and easy is to say that everybody has an inflation problem, everybody has a growth problem. And that's true. But go further, we have massive dispersion. Um, growth, the U.S. is in a much better place than most other countries. Central bank policy, if we think that the Fed faces tough challenges, look at the ECB. Not only do they have high inflation, they have a much more fragile economy and they have the risk of fragmentation. So I think the theme going forward is going to have a strong element of dispersion come into it. And that makes markets have to spend a lot more time thinking about relative values and not just the overall beta, if you like. When you take a look at the framework, policymakers are starting to think more about a structural inflation that will last a much longer time due to deglobalization and due to the sort of structurally higher commodity costs. The market is not buying it. They are still betting on some sort of return to what we have experienced over the past few decades. We know that, uh, Mohammed, you err on the structural side. You say that's probably where we're going. What will it take for the markets to wake up to that reality? And how violent is that pivot? It's going to take time. Um, you know, I'm a buyer of the notion that we are changing macro regimes, as I said earlier, from deficient aggregate demand to deficient aggregate supply. You pointed out to the Wall Street Journal article earlier that listed three reasons why supply is going to be a challenge in the next few years, globalization, deglobalization, et cetera. So we are in a different regime. I think the economists recognize this. I think the Fed officials semi-recognize this. Markets are still in a cyclical mindset. And it's the mindset that has served them well. So it's going to take some time and it's going to take persistence on the part of central banks to try and convince markets that they have to think structurally and not just cyclically. So, Mohammed, with that in mind, what are the characteristics of this new market regime? What do you think the defining characteristics are and will be? I think resilience is going to be the key issue, John. I think you've got to have resilient names in your portfolios, whether it's in credit, whether it's in equities. Um, and resilience means balance sheet, means management teams. Resilience is going to be the most important element to help you navigate this world. Can we talk about the resilience of Europe and finish there? We touched on that at the start of this segment. You talked about the difficulty of the ECB. European gas prices are up by 6.5% again today, Mohammed. I still don't think we fully realize how tough things could be 
in Europe later this year. Do you sense the same thing from the people you speak to? And can you frame how bad do you think this is going to be later this year? It's going to be hard. Um, it's going to be a cost of living crisis. You see it already in the UK and you see the reaction in the UK much earlier than you're seeing it in continental Europe. And on top of that, there's going to be massive demand destruction going on. So Europe is looking at a tough six to nine months. I, like some others that have been on your show, don't see how Europe escapes recession. I hate saying that, but the outlook is one of a recessionary economy. And let's hope it's shallow and <clears throat> short. Uh, uh, Mohammed, Augustin Karstens of Mexico, now general manager of the Bank of International Settlements, has published today in the FT with Chris Giles. It's an extremely important piece about our behavior, our individual game theory with higher inflation. What is the when where we begin to embed high inflation behavior? Are we there now or does it wait for next year? So it depends who we are. Um, if you are the striking um, ports uh, um, workers in the UK or underground workers, you're there. You're already there. Your inflationary expectations have changed. You want to protect your standard of living. It's only a matter of time until they seek not only to, to protect against past erosion in purchasing power, but also future erosion in, in purchasing power. So you're there. In, in the US, you're not there yet. Um, but slowly you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And well, what we're going to find, Tom, and I know you know that in terms of game theory, is that initial conditions vary tremendously. Some workers and some <clears throat> companies are going to be able to protect their margins, yeah. to protect their purchasing powers. Others will not. 